Hey, Vinyl community, welcome to another Thursday night roundtable. The roundtable is more like a card table tonight. We are down two men. Uh, Gary is over on the left coast enjoying the sunshine and the uh, beautiful weather. Uh, check out Gary's latest uh, shout out to everybody in the VC uh, standing on the beach. Uh, and then Chris is a little under the weather, um, so we're very sorry he's not able to be with us today, but we miss him, and hopefully we will uh, get them back on here next week. But um, tonight, the three of us, we are going to talk about 10 of our favorite albums from 2000 to the present day. So pretty much the last two decades uh, we're looking at. Um, not necessarily our very favorites or not our top 10, but they are 10 of our favorite albums from the last two decades, starting with the year 2000. Um, we are going to start with Josh. We're going to go one by one. So, uh, Josh, you want to give us your first pick? Absolutely. So this was a band that came out in the late 90s. I actually saw them um, before their first album even broke, and it was that shit crazy that's the best way to describe it i had no idea what i was witnessing and tom morello said the first time he saw this band he said this is music for insane people and uh i ended up falling in love with the band and their first album is great but their second album is even better produced by rick rubin and that is toxicity uh this is a crazy album it's not your typical heavy metal album it it's the the music is layered and textured and it's it's got everything from, you know, death metal growls to, you know, almost like operatic music. Um, and some of my favorite songs are definitely Deer Dance is probably my favorite. Um, the big hits were Chop Suey, Texicity, and Aerials. But every single song is great on this album. And I absolutely love it. I love the production of this album. It's a crazy album, uh, but it's great. So that's my number 10. Wow, I feel like, you know, I, I've never seen you show that album before. I had no idea that you were into that. So learn something new today. That's uh, yep. very cool. Um, yeah, I like that album, too. Did it come out? Um, 2001. It came out the week before 9-11. Okay, all right. And what were you saying? I said, I, I always was, uh, I never really liked them when they first came out, but I've grown to like them. I have like five or six records now, so. Uh, and especially that one, that's a good one. And their first one's really dark. <laughs> it's really dark. Yeah, yeah they're really so crazy. Yeah, it was, it's really dark. But the, the vocals are really cool on that album. You're right. He goes, he has a bunch of different vocal styles on there. And it kind of appeals to the Tom Waits fan in me. Like, it's <laughs> like, Waits is so insane that one track is like circus music and the next music's like an old blues song. And then that's the thing with, with, you know, System of a Down, you don't know what you're going to get from track to track. Um, they were so different and so innovative. And, uh, you know, that album was a, definitely a landmark album. I feel like it it changed heavy metal to a certain extent. No one could replicate it, but everybody was like, okay, well, this is something completely different. Mm -hmm. Cool. Right. So my number 10, and um, I've got a whole bunch of albums that are related here, kind of, but none by the same artist, but they're kind of related. You have and a this theme is going, them, Aaron? Yeah. <laughs> This is one of them here, and this is one of my favorite records in the last 10 years. It came out 2015. I've shown it before. It was the Eagles of Death Metal with Zipper Down. Oh, cool Love shirt. that record. Okay, so when Aaron, <laughs> you know, it's interesting because Aaron um, for months has been on about this album. Like, oh, Eagles of Death Metal, Zipper Down, it's awesome, it's great. And I was like, yeah, yeah. And I listened to it on Spotify. I'm like, yeah, you know, yeah, it's, it's cool. But then when I went to Idaho and he played that, I am like, I got to get that record. That record is awesome. I'm sorry to step over your words. Aaron. <laughs> I, uh, I've just been on the hunt for that record because since you played it, um, it's fantastic. It's addictive. It's, it's got like a, almost a dance groove all the way through it, but it's still heavy and it's got witty lyrics and the music is amazing. Josh Homme's great on the drums on it which is odd because he's a guitarist and um, there's the, and they do a really cool cover of uh, save a prayer from Duran Duran, which I love, love how they do that song, but like this song complexity, it's just, I just love it. And um, 
uh, let's see, I love you all the time. It's totally different. He's like singing in French on part of it. And what I really love about this record, there's the, there's the band. It's a two piece band. Only those two guys right there, Josh Homme and uh, Jesse Hughes. But I really love how they did this because I put a booklet here with, with a printing large enough that you can read it easy and all these little crazy photos of the band going through it. I just, I love how they did that. They're, you know, you can tell they got a sense of humor and that shows in their music. And um, there you go. I love how they did that. Such a great album and great band. And it's my favorite album by them. This one here is probably my second favorite by them, but I love every album they've done. And I think they're just a really underrated, great band that's going right now. And the thing about this album too, um, that when they were touring for this album, that's when all those people got killed in Paris. It was right. show, this when they were uh, playing a show in Paris for this album. So that's, it's kind of a sad thing. They kind of went on hiatus a bit after that. And then they've just been doing those cover, the cover album deals, but I hope they do another one soon. All right, there was so. a song on the album that it was their first single off that album. I was so obsessed with them. I'm trying to think what the name was. Dave Grohl was in the video. The music video, I think. Do you remember what it was? I never thought, you know, it could have been um, Skin Tight Boogie, I'd, I'd imagine. Let me check. I'll, I'll let you know in a second, but go ahead, Jeff. What were we going to say? Well, I was just going to say, I mean, you can tell they're having so much fun making that record. It's a fun record to listen to. It's well produced. You can dance to it. You can rock out to it. The lyrics, like you say, Aaron, are, you know, I mean, they're not like Weird Al Yankovic kind of funny, but they're like, you know, um, I don't know what I want to say, but they have a sense of humor. It's not comedy. Yeah. Either. yeah. Like they have a sense of humor about it. They're not taking themselves too seriously. You know, it's like, we're not the white stripes. We're not the black keys, but you know, I don't know for my money, I think they're just as good as the black keys and you, I know you like the black keys a lot, so you may disagree, but I no, really no. like that album a lot. And I, yeah, I, cause I really, um, after spending some time with it, when we were listening to it, I'm like, yeah, this is a great album, like all the way through. Yep. And and I uh, I pointed that out on one of your flip videos. I said you got to go buy it, go back and buy that. And you're ah. I well, <laughs> I know I didn't take you seriously, and now I'm sorry because I can't find it anywhere. Like Amazon yep. doesn't have it, and it's you know, <laughs> so I'm on the lookout for it. But it's uh, I, I love the album that you got us. Uh, you know, the covers album, but that one um also is really good. This is better. <clears throat> All right, well, I'll go check Purchase Street Saturday. <laughs> see if far as that album, Jeff. Did you find out what song that was? No, I'll have to do more research, but I remember I loved it. It might have been Skin Tight Boogie. Yeah, that's I think probably that was their first okay. single. That was their first single from this, I'm pretty sure. Mm -hmm. Great song. Yeah. All right, well, um, off camera, Josh and I were talking about, like, we're worried. You know, it's almost like, oh, I don't want to show up to the party wearing the same clothes. You know, uh, so I'm kind of worried that we had some of the same albums that we were going to show today. And this is one that I'm a little worried Josh might have, but then, you know, maybe not. But I am going with uh, Death Cab for Cutie, Plans. This was my introduction to Death Cab for Cutie. And I have to credit my brother because he's the one who turned me on to this band. But I feel like now that I'm more familiar with their back catalog, I think this was their first fully... I mean, transatlanticism is great, but this is like their music for the masses. Like, okay, this is as close as we're going to get to cracking like the top 40. Um, it's just such a great, and I don't want to call it power pop, but it's definitely melodic alternative rock. Um, ben Gibbard is such a great songwriter and he knows how to craft a melody. It's almost like Paul McCartney in that way. Um, and this one has got some of my favorite tracks on here are Soul Meets Body, Crooked Teeth, uh, I think is a fantastic track. I love Brothers on a Hotel Bed. Uh, Marching Bands of Manhattan is a great leadoff track. But um, I saw I was for, very fortunate to see them live, not on this tour, but the one that they did uh, for their next album. Um, and... I, they're great live. They're, this is a great record. And, you know, Ben Gibbard is one of those songwriters that, um, I don't know, there's so many songs where it's like, God, that's me. Like, that's my life. I totally connect with a lot of his lyrics um, on here. But, um, yeah, I don't know. It's 
Death Cat for Cutie's got a lot of great albums. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know. But this this is, uh, I think, probably my favorite. Um, and I could listen to this over and over. I don't think there was a weak track on it. Uh, but if you like alternative and not like heavy, uh, it's not like Nine Inch Nails alternative, but it's sort of closer to um, like if you like 80s rock, a little bit closer to kind of like melodic bands like The Replacements or The Smiths or, uh, you know, even maybe a little bit of um, R.E.M. I don't know. But Josh, help me out here. You like Death Cab for Cutie, too. I love it. And I didn't choose them because I knew you would choose them for me. And that's a fantastic <laughs> album. And I did see them on that tour. And Brothers on a Hotel Bed is got to be in my top five favorite songs by them. It's to me that's when I realized I love that album. Like I, I was, I was liking it. I'm like, this is so good. So good. And then I heard that song. I'm like, I friggin' love this album. Um, yeah. They're amazing. They're alternative. I think that, you know, I played them for the first time the other day for Michelle and, you know, from someone that likes primarily country music and her first thing she said was his voice is so beautiful. And the second thing she said, the music is so interesting. I feel that they have complex sometimes you would think like oh that this song wouldn't go with this music but it fits so perfectly i don't know how they do it uh and like jeff said it's not really um it does have a pop edge but it's it's so rooted in bands like rem like you said where you know you're listening to something that's not designed for the masses yeah so narrow stairs was the follow-up and this is a tour that i saw them on um but it's it's a great companion piece if you like this would be the I think the next one to get Translanticism is is good we have the facts and we're voting yes is a, is a, a great album also uh, but definitely you know I don't, I don't hear many people talk about them I don't see them get a whole lot of love uh, in the, the vinyl community but I, I think they're definitely a band that if you're looking for something new and you know you like great songwriting you like uh, you know great production um, you know, you like uh, alternative kind of off the beaten path. I would say Death Cab for Cutie for sure is a band that uh, you want to check out. Absolutely. And thank you for sending me that record. You said the second one you showed there, you sent that to me. And I've heard it a few times. It's not one of my favorites, but I actually like it though. So it's not one that I, I throw it on every couple of weeks or so, every three weeks. Yeah, it's a little to, different, you know, I mean, yeah, and I figured, like, I, you know, I knew it wasn't going to be something that, you know, was going to be on your turntable a lot, Aaron, but I thought, well, it's a little, you know, I could see there's elements of it that you would appreciate because you like a little bit of the heart of rock, but um, yeah, it's it's really good, and I, um, you know, I, I hope I, I get to see them live again because they're fantastic. All right, All right. next album, Josh. So the next album, I want to credit my friend Mark, who introduced me to them in the early 2000s. So uh, I had I was so much older than this person. It was like he worked at the same place I did. And he was probably 18 years old and I'm in my 30s. But he loved rock and roll. He loved progressive rock, he liked classic rock, he liked heavy metal. And he was a sponge. So he had said, I never heard. I, I would name a band. I'd say, I'd say Megadeth because I never heard of them. I'd like making you a CD. I'd make a CD. Two weeks later, he's like, I bought their entire catalog. <laughs> he'd say, name another band. I'm Grateful Dead. I never heard of them. I'd make him a CD. He'd be like, I bought this, I bought this. He was so great. But he also introduced me to a lot of bands. And because he liked progressive rock, and he said, Josh, I know you're not huge into progressive rock, but I know you love Tool. I want you to give this band a chance. And he gave me the CD. And he's like, take it home as long as you need it. And the next day I brought it back. He goes, oh, you didn't like it? I said, no, I went out and bought it. And uh, I bought it on vinyl. And it is Crack the Sky by Mastodon, which is a progressive metal masterpiece. This, the, the album is, the song Crack the Sky is about the drummer's sister who, her name was Sky. That's why it's spelled S-K-Y-E. And she had uh, killed herself. She had committed suicide uh, as a teenager. And that song really deals with uh, the pain that he could see in his sister's eyes. But this album is very progressive, uh, you know, in terms of heavy metal. It's only got, it's got seven songs, I think, and it's like over an hour long. <laughs> yeah, it's just fantastic. Uh, but Oblivion is, every time I've seen them live, they played Oblivion. 
Uh, but The Last Baron is an epic last track with lots of, uh, you know, time changes. And it's heavy. It's not for everybody. Like, if you're a fan of, of just progressive rock, it may not be for you uh, because the vocals are really heavy. Uh, but they have three singers. The drummer sings, uh, the bass guitarist sings, and the lead guitarist sings. I mean, no, I'm sorry, the rhythm guitarist sings. Um, so, yeah, so it is complex, but it's awesome. Master on Crack the Sky. Great record. Jordan, mine's so much brighter. Maybe it's just the camera. Well, do you have the 45 RPM version? Because nope. I don't. No, nope, this is the regular. Maybe you have a newer copy than mine. Mine is kind of beaten down. I need an upgraded copy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send you mine. We'll trade. Okay. <laughs> well, the thing is, if Josh recommends an album, it's good. Like, yeah. I would buy any album that Josh recommended. I would buy without hearing a note just because, you know, Josh, as far as like musical tastes go, um, you know, Josh has some of the most diverse musical tastes, but also I've never, any anytime Josh has said, you need to go out and get this, or this is great, whether it was Lana Del Rey or whether it was, you know, a, another band like Lord Huron. Uh, anytime I've gone out, it's like, yeah, this is fantastic. Dawes, you know, I had heard of Dawes, but, you know, as soon as Josh said, this band is great, this guy's an excellent songwriter, you know, I ran out and started buying up their stuff, and he's absolutely right, so... Um, I can tell Mastodon, uh, you know, even though it sounds a little heavier than stuff. It's that, probably a little heavier than your normal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Be the first time for you, buddy. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it's great. Yeah. Like yeah. Great, great album. Yep. Yeah. So my next one was um, from 2010, and I love this band. You were kind of talking about it earlier, and I like to thank PBS for getting me into this band. All right. Guys, <laughs> actually like a, a few years like back a decade ago i didn't have cable i had and i saw them play on pbs and it was uh it blew me away and this is the album it's from 2010 this is brothers from black keys my right. favorite keys record i love this album and they're just an amazing band you know uh, the, the whole thing with them and the white stripes i like both of them but uh I, I prefer the black keys a little bit but this one here has just got some amazing songs, you know, like Tighten Up. I love that. Um, Black Mud is one of my favorites, the instrumental. Almost reminds me of a Clutch song. You know, Clutch does their instrumental. It's kind of dark and just has this uh, mood to it. But I really love this record. And uh, if I was to start, tell someone to start the Black Keys to first album to get to them, I'd say this one. When I love the album cover, I love the just the whole the album cover, the back cover. It's just so irreverent. It's so like <laughs> art, you know. It's so like very self aware. Like, hey, buy this album. It's great. This is an album by the Black Keys. And, <laughs> yeah. But it like you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's definitely something that stands out in the record bins. Uh, and, and then they did their uh, impression of the White album. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it lyric sheet poster which is cool another really one actually, this is the, the giant lyrics section of my uh, collection yeah but yeah this is that's a great record um amazing they're just a really uh, great band and like i said pbs actually introduced me to them which is really weird nice and, was yeah. austin city what's up the show austin city limits was it that show on pbs I it might have been. I don't think it was, though. I think oh, it was just... Love and it was just them playing most of the show, and at the end of it, they had a couple other musicians come out and play a few songs. But most cool. of the show was just two guys. Nice. But they, they used to do a lot of... The, I used to watch a lot of them on there when I didn't have cable back in the back in the old... Way back in 10 years, 15 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> so. All right. Well, my album... Now... It's pretentious. It's very hipster. Like hipsters love this band. They're very pretentious. Uh, they're kind of Baroque pop. Uh, you know, you may get some eye rolls when I mention who this band is, but I don't care. I love this album. I'm talking about the Decemberists uh, and their album, The Crane Wife. And this one stylistically, I think, is the most diverse album that they've ever come out with. But this has elements of progressive rock. It's got elements of like Americana. 
it's got folk it's got um and i i love that because they've got not only do they have a great uh male vocalist but they got a female vocalist and they kind of trade off on vocals you know where she takes the female part and he takes the male part they're having like a dialogue um but it's just great it's such a journey i mean they've got like parts one and parts two uh here on a couple of songs it's just a really great album um from start to finish and um yeah stylistically it's like all over the map and that's why i love it it's like not one song sounds like another um but it's very melodic it's um you know almost like some of the music is music you'd like hear it's like renaissance period music but then the next minute they're like channeling emerson lake and palmer and then they're channeling rem and then they're channeling you know it's just like each song has got like a different feel and a different vibe to it um you know i think the cover artwork is a little weird uh but yeah great record uh december is you know one of those bands that people are kind of like oh well you know they're very uh i don't know they're very kind of cerebral uh, a lot of people kind of find them a little you know too high brow, i guess you might say because you know their, their lyrics reference a lot of uh you know 19th century 18th century kind of stuff but uh, i don't care that album's a great listen and uh, i think they're a great band so it sounds I like a dog album there what's that well, all your things you've been saying it's exactly your uh, sounds like you're describing a prog record is that yeah. a prog record? you know the two parts right. and all the century yeah and like there's a song yeah. here and that's why it's so weird because you know, for a band like this, like up until this point, um, you know, there's a song on here, The Island, which it's total prog rock. Like it's totally, uh, it sounds like a, a track that, you know, Emerson, Lake and Palmer or Yes, or, you know, any prog rock band, um, you know, it sounds so much like that. And yet, you know, then the next minute, it's like kind of like an acoustic folk ballad it's like wow the juxtaposition of that is just so you know but that's what i like about it it's like okay it's not like you put this on it's like okay yeah one sound one song sounds like all the others i mean it really doesn't that's what i like about it and the songs stick in your head you know it's like an earworm once you've heard a song it's like it's going to be in your head and you're going to be you know playing it over and over uh again but anyway yeah, I, lo I love that band. I think they're great. I think that you're right that a lot of people probably, because it's so stylistically different from song to song, it might be hard to to pigeonhole them. And that's why I think they're, it's like, oh, that's a hipster band because the only way people can describe it. It's all the elements say that it's prog rock, but it's, but it has prog rock elements, but it's not really a prog band. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and their, their album after that was actually a concept record. Um, it was called the... Uh, um, hazards of love and it's like a total concept right it's like almost like a you know a pop opera or whatever you want to call it rock opera um yeah. but yeah so they're not afraid to try something different there's no chance of them ever getting played on the radio because their stuff is so different so unless you know somebody's turned you on to them chances are you've never heard them or if you listen to npr you know it's like an npr band is basically you know <laughs> One of those bands that are kind of like you know music in between the news segments or something they might play but um definitely cool all right so my my next band is a band i talk about all the time jeff actually already mentioned them said that said that i recommended them they're one of my favorite bands of the last 20 years when i initially described them to the the vc i didn't know how to describe them and Though I'll kind of paint the same picture again. The lyrics to me are re very reminiscent of Billy Joel. And what I mean by that is that they tell a very linear story. It's very easy to understand. Billy Joel doesn't hide behind analog weird analogies. Billy Joel just spills his guts, right? And says like, you know, you're, they're all impressed with your Halston dress and the people that you knew at Elaine's, right? He just spills it out. And th this singer does the same thing. Um, so the lyrics are very easy to decipher. The music doesn't sound anything like Billy Joel. I would say that they're more just of a classic rock band. They have influences from uh, Simon and Garfunkel, but uh, also heavier influences. And uh, I would say some pop leanings, but 
uh, pop rock, that is. Uh, and that is Dawes. And this is my favorite Dawes album, which is all your favorite bands. Um, I love all their albums. Uh, the one I just bought, Jeff, would have came very close to being picked today. Um, but I chose this one. Uh, and I really feel like even Aaron, you would love this album uh, because it's hard not to love. It's just a rock album. The songs are very poppy, but you know, the Beatles songs had pop elements to it also. Um, Things Happen is one of my all time favorite songs. Definitely one of my favorite songs the last 20 years. Um, that's a song where they just try to talk about, you have to accept that things happen, right? It's not like, why does all this bad stuff happen to me? Or why does all this good stuff happen to me? Bad stuff happens to good people and good stuff happens to bad people. It's just the way it is. Uh, but one song that I would love everybody to check out on here is the song, All Your Favorite Bands. And what he's talking about is um, how maybe there's someone in your life you haven't talked to in a long time and, you know, they pop into your head, right? And that's what happens to him. He's like, he's laying there, he wakes up and he starts thinking about this friend. And he says, you know, I hope that your, uh, your brother's El Camino is still on the road. I hope that uh, sure. you still have app that says let's party right all these great things and he says i hope that all your favorite bands are still together like i hope that clutch never breaks up because i love Aaron. you know what i mean i hope lucero never breaks up because i love myself you know like that's a big thing when you're a rock fan when your bands break up it's like your parents getting divorced uh so if you're a rock fan and you haven't heard this band trust in me it is so good it's not hard rock i'm, I'm stressing that but I can't imagine people not loving this album, uh, you know, or the, uh, you know, most of their albums, I will say, are, are fantastic. So there you go. Jaws, one of my favorite bands of the last two decades. Unless your favorite band is you too, and then, like, I fucking hope they break up. You know, <laughs> be like the best thing you could say to a person who's a U2 <laughs> fan, but, uh, you know, that's another discussion. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So... For my next on one, note, this, Aaron. Huh? On that note, Aaron. Uh, <laughs> Clutch. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is kind of related. I got a bunch that are kind of related. You'll see what I mean. But um, I was going to pick this record here, but I've talked about it so much. I decided to go with this one just because it is so great. And this is The Coyote Who Spoke in Tons by John Garcia. And it's from 2017. And it's basically him doing a bunch of his stuff throughout his career acoustically and then some live acoustic. And it's just an amazing uh, record. And I'm, I know when Chris and Jeff were here, I, I did I play for you too, Jeff. I know Chris loved it. He's like, I got to get that record. because it's just so Yeah, cool. no, you, you did play it. And that's a fantastic album. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, you know, it's got stuff like Green Machine, which is a Kaya song, Space Cadet and Gardenia, and two more Kaya songs. El Rodeo is a Hermano song. And then he's got, you know, Argelbintu, the Boulevard. Those are from the, this record up here, the solo John Garcia, which I almost put in. That's one of my very favorites. But all this stuff is so good. But, Josh, you would love this record. <laughs> I'm sure. It goes for a lot of money, though. It's uh, it's crazy. When I bought it, it was like $25. Now you can't find it for, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. But uh, it's just so great. And you really hear his voice a lot more on the acoustic because he tends to have a lot of, um, like, heavy – music usually behind him and when you hear him acoustic his voice really comes out a lot john garcia and uh, this is an amazing amazing record there's awesome the, yeah space oh, cadet man <laughs> gardenia those kind of sounds are so good so there we go <laughs> i All love right. Kai and i discovered them last year Who? really i mean caius i discovered yeah. them last you know with you being my friend and always talking about them uh and i love that band and they would have made my list i think they came very close but they were the great it was the 90s right yeah. yeah but the song gardenia starts off that uh, sky valley record space cadets always on yeah. also on two songs from that album around there so very different sounding acoustic. all right um my uh next album is um, I just kind of I mean I, I had this but just this week when we were talking about albums from the last couple decades I, I played it again and then I remembered why I love this album so much but 
She is one of my favorite female singers of all time. I'm talking about uh, Nico Case. And she's a singer. I could listen to her sing the phone book. Like I would pay money to hear her sing the phone book. That's how strong her voice is. And I think this is probably, she used to be in a band called The New Pornographers. Um, mm -hmm. And she's had a pretty uh, distinguished solo career. But this is my favorite solo album of hers. It's called um, Middle Cyclone. And she's almost like a, like the, the music sounds somewhat like Nick Cave. Uh, but it's just, uh, you know, she's got such a great songwriting. Uh, she's a great songwriter, a great singer. Um, Garth Hudson from the band um, plays on this album. Um, there are some other uh, renowned artists as well on here. But um, yeah, great singer. She's got a great, you know, I, I'd call it a little bit like kind of power pop. There's some jangly pop on here. There's some brooding uh, kind of Nick Cave uh, style uh, music on here. Um, say, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Sam Phillips. Um, not the Sun Records person, but she was a female uh, singer-songwriter. Uh, it's a, kind of a little bit like her music. Um, but I always thought like this cover art, it's almost like reminds me of like the cover of Candy O by the Cars because she's a redhead. But she's like, I'm not laying down on the trunk of this card. I'm taking up my sword and <laughs> all, like whatever. I just kind of, I was just, like thinking about that. But um, yeah, I'm sending this record to you, Josh, because I think you Thanks, you like Lana Del Rey. Uh, yeah. I think this would be like right up your alley, but um, just, you know, tremendous. I love her voice. And she does a cover of Harry Nielsen's Don't Forget Me. She does a cover of Sparks um never turn your back on mother earth uh she does a great version of that on here and then there, she's got some originals as well but it's just a, a great uh great album all the way through i never knew she was in the new pornographers i love their song uh high ticket attractions that song mm -hmm. blows my mind every time i hear it it's fantastic yeah yeah no they were great and then you know she like i say i think she's probably the most successful member to come out of that band after they broke up but um yeah great and she's she's uh not bad to look at either to check yeah. <laughs> nice yeah that always sells sells some records <laughs> absolutely yeah she can she can kneel on my hood anytime <laughs> <laughs> with a score yeah yeah so my next album um is an artist that i listen to my entire life uh before i bought records uh this artist was played in my household and he had one of his biggest albums in 2002 i had really started to listen to him in the mid 90s uh i had heard that glenn danzig was writing a song for him and i was like oh i've listened to johnny cash i knew Folsom prison blues i knew uh, a lot of his son records. I love rockabilly too. In the nineties, I got really into rockabilly with social distortion uh, and that type of music. Uh, so I was like all into Johnny Cash. Uh, and then this album came out about the first day and about six months later, it seemed like everyone in America had this album. Everybody was talking to me about this album. Uh, and that is Johnny Cash. Uh, this is when the man comes around. He had a huge hit with it with a Nine Inch Nails cover of her. Um, you know, by this point, Johnny Cash had really had lost his voice. He didn't have, not that he had a lot of range to begin with, but Rick Rubin was so smart because Rick Rubin knew that Johnny Cash uh, could be a star again. And if he just was given the right music to play and let him do his own thing. Uh, and the, I love all the American recordings. And this is actually one of my least favorite. And it and that shows how great these albums are. Uh, but this has uh, When the Man Comes Around, Hurt, Give My Love to Rose, Bridge Over Troubled Water, I Hung My Head, First Time I Ever Saw Your Face, Personal Jesus, uh, which is, you know, unbelievable that he covered Depeche Mode in my life. Um, you know, Desperado, the Eagles song. I'm still low to I could cry. It's just hit after hit after hit. 
of you know their covers a, a couple of songs that he did back in the day like give my love to rose he had done back in the day but just stripped down and raw he recorded so many songs of rick rubin that i have like a seven vinyl box set of all outtakes out in the other room uh, which could have easily made my list but this is a great album if you don't own it even if you're not a johnny cash fan uh it's a nice testament to his legacy and you know he does some great covers on it well, some of those songs, it's almost like they were written for Johnny Cash. I mean, he definitely interprets them in such a way. It's like, wow, you know. Um, Did you ever hear Trent Reznor's reaction when he heard it? No. So Trent Reznor was like, you know, he was honored that Johnny Cash wanted to record his song. But he said he was, he got the CD in and he was in the middle of a million different things. And he put it on and it was like background noise. And he was like not paying attention. We didn't even think much of it. But later on that night, he sat down and the person had sent him the CD and had sent him the film, which is the music video. And he played the music video and sat there and realized what Johnny Cash had done. And Trent Reznor said, this is no longer my song. You know, like this is obviously Johnny Cash has taken this song from me uh, because, you know, he changed it. Trent Reznor wrote, wrote the song about heroin, you know, the heroin. And Johnny Cash took it about his life and maybe some of the mistakes he had made you know, the journey, you know, from how he got from point A to point, you know, B. Uh, but it's just fantastic. And Trent Reznor uh, was at that point just honored and flawed and, and, you know, as anybody would be. Well, Wright said Fred said, said the same thing about his cover of I'm Too Sexy. <laughs> I think it's on that album. They said, that's no longer our song. Johnny Cash totally, like, he hijacked that. And that's now a, a Johnny Cash song, but... I would totally buy that album. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Johnny Cass does Tiffany, Right Said Fred, Debbie Gibson, and the New Kids on the Block. <laughs> yeah, and there's a MoFi version. There's a MoFi. <laughs> Sign me up for the MoFi. Yeah. Johnny, Jeff, we need another one of those MoFi videos where you do something like the New Kids on the Block step by step, you know, <laughs> not in their big album. The album that came out right before they broke up. Yeah, I'd forgotten about that video and somebody just commented on it recently and they're like, Barry Manilow, MoFi, Vanilla <laughs> MoFi. And so, I, you know, some people, like the first couple of records, they thought it was real, but anyway. <laughs> All right, Aaron, your next one. All right, my next one was released in 2019, so it's fairly new. And to me, this is the best record this artist has ever done. And he's in different bands. This is the Rock and Tours of Health of Stranger. I love this album. I think it's the best thing that uh, Jack White's ever done. But I like a lot of the White Stripes and his solo stuff as well. But this one just really resonated with me for some reason. And, uh, you, know, it's, you know, just starting out with Born and Raised, I love that song. Um, Don't Bother Me. You know, even the, uh, the Donovan cover, I really love too. Hey, Jip. He does a really great job on that one. But I just, I just think this is a, a magnificent, underrated album. I mean, it's, I don't know if it's underrated, but I don't really see a lot of people talk about this record. And I really love it. I just think it was a, a really great album for the last few years. It's, this is my last non-hard rock one I'm putting in here. <laughs> hard well, rock the, cool, the cool thing about that album, Aaron, and some people might not realize it, and I'm totally being serious here, and I have to put that disclaimer on because people, you know, they think I'm full of shit all the time, but actually that album is pasted a pasted over a cover it's like a they they take the the beatles yesterday and today the butcher cover and they take like the cover and then they paste like the rock rack and tears faces over the beatles and they actually did a like a reproduction of um uh, the butcher cover and if you steam that cover off but underneath the record is a, a butcher cover. Look it up online. They actually have like photographs of it, but it's very cool. And that's the thing like Jack White, um, you know, he's because he's such an audiophile and he's such a vinyl enthusiast, he does all kind of cool stuff like that. But yeah, that record, um, it's sort of a Easter egg that if you steam off that cover, there's a um, like a parody of the, the Beatles yesterday and today butcher cover. So does that make it like a second state and it's worth less money? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, well, I don't know. I mean, it's not going to fetch as much as obviously like the Beatles uh, cover did, but 
Um, you know, I've seen people, pe there's videos of people like that uh, peel it off and they show what the real cover looks like, but it's sort of a cool little footnote about that record. So, I'm totally the, so is it the yeah. whole cover or just like a, a middle part? I think just the front cover, I think. Yeah, it's, so there's just yeah, the I don't know if you can see the image, but that's what it is. I'd actually heard about that, but I thought, well, I don't have one of those. This is a new one. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it was just certain pressings or if it's every pressing, but uh, it's still cool not for us, you know. Yeah, but this is a great record, though. Yeah. It's really good. It's just, uh, I, when I first heard it, I was like, oh, this is all right. And I kept listening to it, and it just kicked me. It's just, I, I couldn't stop listening to it for a couple months. Mm -hmm. Really good stuff. Yeah. Um, so this album is one that um, probably neither of you will own or care for. I'm probably the only one in this video who cares about this particular band, but I don't care. So there's a this is an 80s synth pop band. And in 2000, they, they broke up um, in like the late 80s. And um, I forget which member of the band. I think it was... Um, uh, well, anyway, it's not uh, important, but one of the members, he, he put out a, a couple of albums under the band's name, uh, which they were, for all intents and purposes, solo albums. And then the two of them, um, Paul Humphreys and Andrew McCluskey, uh, I think were the names of the band, they got, they reunited. And the band I'm talking about is OMD. Um, and they put out, this is like their first album at, yeah, after they had reunited. Um, after I, I believe it was um, Paul Humphreys had put out a couple albums um, under the OMD name, even though it was just him and some studio musicians. But this sounds like classic OMD from the 80s, both, but it's updated a little bit. It's definitely synth pop all the way through, but there's so many familiar elements. To OMD, you know, like the, a song like Helen of Troy, like only a band like OMD would put out a song like Helen of Troy. And it sounds like OMD circa 1986. It's great. They've updated their sound. I mean, they're still using the analog synthesizers, um, but it really is sort of like they're picking up right where they left off after the Pacific Age, which was their last studio album, the two of them. Um, but it's just a great album. I love it. It's like, so it was like, oh, great. You know, because easily... They could have put out a crap album. They could have fallen on their face. It could have been like, oh, they're they're chasing trends. You know, they could have tr tried to sound too contemporary, but they didn't. They sound like, you know, OMD of the 80s, but with a little bit of an updated sound. Um, but I, yeah, I was so happy. They put out a couple albums since then. Um, they're still going strong. They're putting out live albums. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm hoping there's going to be like an OMD renaissance. Uh, Josh, you were just talking about the fact that they're releasing a uh, box set of a couple of their 12 inch singles, um, which is very cool. But um, yeah, Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark is one of those bands from the 80s that I've always loved, always, you know, their whole catalog I've appreciated. They don't sound like, even though they're synth pop, they don't sound like they don't sound like Depeche Mode. They don't sound like New Order. They don't sound like Soft Cell. I mean, they sound so unique. There's so many different elements to their sound that set them apart from, you know, the rest of the new wave bands that were coming out with uh, synthesizer-dominated music. You know, they're definitely, you know, students of craft work. Um, but, you know, they, they're, some of their 80s albums were very, uh, you know, seminal back in the early 80s. Um, you know, Architecture and Morality. Dazzle Ships was great organization, um, but this definitely, uh, you know, follows that tradition. And if you're a fan of OMD from the 80s and you haven't checked this album out, definitely need to. You will not be disappointed. Nice. Yeah, yeah and tune into Coming Soon on Tuesday, and I'll tell you about that box set. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. A couple of singles. That's kind of uh, an oxymoron, isn't it? Well, I think that, Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong, but fans of that type of music definitely collect the 12-inch singles, don't they? Oh, oh yeah. I've got, like, I've, I've got a shitload of OMD 12-inches because, you know, they what they would do, bands like that, is, you know, they, they'd have a couple of singles, 
and then they'd put out 12 inches, which they'd have like a um, extended remix. There'd be some B sides, even one of the B sides might have a remix, um, you know, that wasn't on the album, but yeah, they're 12 inches, you know, OMD, uh, you know, like Duran Duran, like the Pesh Mode, you know, some of their B sides were as good as the stuff that they put on albums. Um, their remixes were, you know, sometimes a kind of a reimagining of a particular song or a single. Um, so yeah, I'm interested to see what 12 inches they're including because, um, you know, they were definitely a singles band, although their albums uh, were great also. Cool. All right. So the next artist, you know, I was worried that Jeff would have on here, but I'm going to go for it. It's one of my favorite artists of all time. I'll tell you, I discovered this artist in the mid 90s. I worked for a company which will remain nameless just in case I want to protect the innocent. And uh, I was like 25 and there was this girl that worked there 20 and she was beautiful and we would always flirt. She had a boyfriend. I didn't have a girlfriend. And, uh, you know, she used to make me mix CDs and this artist was pr primarily on the CD. Um, and then one day she got a fight with her boyfriend and showed up in my house miraculously and it was spectacular. Afterwards, I said, so what does this mean? And she goes, nothing. And I was like, okay. Uh, but so I didn't get much out of the, the friendship. But I did get a love for this artist. Uh, and so that was the mid-90s. It was right around his first two albums. Uh, his albums kept getting better until his death. And this is probably my favorite album by him. And that's Elliot Smith, Figure Eight. This is an absolute masterpiece. Uh, there's not a bad song on here. I saw him on this tour in Providence. It was $13. This is probably his most rocking album. Um, the very Beatles-influenced. Uh, if you have not listened to him, he's got a, the most beautiful voice, probably one of the most beautiful voices ever. Uh, his lyrics are fantastic. Um, Can't Make a Sound, to me, is the standout track on this. Um, the great thing about Elliot Smith is like six months before this album came out, he released a single and it was, you know, okay, hey, I have a new album coming out and it was a song, Son of Sam. And the single that he released, he released it on a 45 and he released it as a CD single is 100% completely different than the version that's on the album. So like he would do things like that. So like his fans that went out and bought that single, they have a completely different version of that song. Uh, there's not a bad song on here. If you were to listen to this, Aaron, if you've never heard Elliot Smith, you'd have to be in a Beatles mood. If you're in a Beatles mood, uh, you would like this album. Um, but it's always What's that? I'm always in a Beatles mood. Yeah, so yeah. It, <laughs> Jeff, will you concur? Do you feel like it's very Beatles-esque? See, when I listen to Elliot Smith, I borrowed a bunch of his records from some, from some friends of mine a while back, and I instantly thought of John Lennon when I was listening to it yeah. as an influence, and I actually liked him. I, I, I think I listened to that one. Maybe I don't know if I remember if I listened to that record, but I listened to th two or three of them, and I actually liked him. Yeah. yeah, His early stuff is very acoustic. Now, he was yeah. a huge metal fan i will tell mm -hmm. you that like i actually when i saw him in concert i think he was wearing like an accept t-shirt or something but he knew that he couldn't play that type of music <laughs> you know like he's like my voice is too delicate you know like i i, I couldn't go out there and, and play that type of music but he loved the beatles he loved john lennon loved paul mccartney but go ahead jeff what were you gonna say you could probably speak more eloquently about it than me well that um that album was actually recorded at abbey road studios it was recorded in England uh, at Abbey Road Studios where the Beatles recorded. And, um, you know, the thing about this album is it's really, for me, it's his best album. I mean, hands down. Not that his other albums are not great. I think XO is great. I think Either Or is a great album. But this album, it was like fully realized. I mean, I, he's got a fucking Mellotron on here, you know, <laughs> more. You know, everything um, means nothing to me. You know, yeah. just so it sounds almost like the flaming lips a little bit, you know, what they were doing with, um, you know, at War with the Mystics on that record. But, you know, Elliot Smith, this was like kind of like probably the most commercial album that he ever put out. But it's also I mean, it, it kicks ass in spaces. It's very melodic. It's gentle. It's got some ballads. It's definitely got Beatlesque uh, music written all over it. And this is the thing, like, you know, Elliot Smith, the way he looks here, after this album came out, the tour to support this, 
is it was all downhill, unfortunately, for him after this. He got into heroin. He started using heavy drugs. You know, he looks very kind of like clean cut, you know, average Joe here. But he looked totally like strung out. I mean, his hair got long, greasy, stringy. Um, you know, he started forgetting the words to his lyrics uh, when he would do concerts. Um, and unfor very unfortunately, he passed away. It was either a suicide or a murder, depending on whose story you believe. Uh, but, you know, this was kind of, you know, this was the top of the mountain for him. Unfortunately, you know, because of whether all the drugs he was doing, the heroin use, there might have been some mental illness involved. But he definitely, you know, became very paranoid. He was convinced that his record company was out to get him and were following him. I mean, it's a very tragic story if you're familiar at all with Elliot Smith. And he really descended into drugs and mental illness. And I mean, there's there's shows that he did where you know, he would start a song and then end it abruptly. And then he would forget lyrics and people were like booing. And, you know, he really kind of embarrassed himself. And, you know, he had started to record his follow-up album to this. And um, unfortunately it wasn't released during his lifetime, but um, it's called From a Basement on a Hill, which is also a very good album. But it's, you know, again, it's one of those like, what was that the album he would have put out? Or, you know, unfortunately it was just sort of the, the best they could, the best of the uh, outtakes from the session that he was recording on after this album. But, and I know I'm going on here and I'm rambling or whatever, but this is a great album to own. This would be the place to start if you want to get into Elliot Smith. Great singer songwriter. If you love the Beatles, this is right up your alley. He covered a lot of Beatles songs, most notably the song Because for the soundtrack of American Beauty. Uh, he did, but also live, he covered a lot of Beatles stuff. And he was definitely, he was a big Kiss fan. He loved the Beatles. If you love that kind of music, you will definitely love and appreciate Elliot Smith. Was that my pick or was it yours, John? <laughs> that was mine. But I like that. First off, the song LA on that album is absolutely amazing. I forgot to mention that, that song killer. Um, you're absolutely right. Like uh, many nights in concert, he would break in, into like Jealous Guy by John Lennon. Um, you know, he was uh, a soft-spoken person, um, beautiful person. Unfortunately, he had probably mental illness and drugs. As many, I always feel that geniuses are, are right on the edge of cracking and being absolutely insane. And he was absolutely a genius. Uh, and he had fantastic, fantastic lyrics. Uh, yeah, I mean, well, and people said he was like the most ill-prepared person for fame. Uh, of anybody they'd ever met because he had he recorded that song Miss Misery for the um, Goodwill Hunting soundtrack which actually was up for a Grammy nomination he lost to Celine Dion but um, nonetheless you know he started to get more exposure more people were showing up to his concerts he got a big record deal and all of that pressure he couldn't handle it and he cracked and he got into drugs and you know he just kind of unraveled after that but he was I mean I don't think it's any exaggeration to call him a genius uh, a music genius. And I would call, I would put him on the same level as like a Nick Drake. Uh, yeah. So tragically, you know, passed away very young. Um, but he, without a doubt, he's a brilliant uh, artist and it's very tragic that uh, we lost him so young. All right, Aaron, this, the floor is yours. <laughs> <laughs> we we uh, lost him. <laughs> so this one here, I'm sure Jeff has this. And um, it's it's a great record from 2011. Um, actually, wasn't Elliot Smith from Portland? Yes. Well, I'm following the trend. This is a Portland band, one of my favorite Portland bands. This is Murder of the Mountains from Red Fang. Amazing <laughs> record. Nice. I saw <laughs> I them in the concert. Yeah, yeah, they're great. But this album here, other albums are good, but this one here is way by far their best, I think. It's an amazing record. Stuff like Wires and Human Herd and the number 13 are amazing songs. They're kind of a stoner metal band, but um, just a really cool cover too. Check that out. So this is a lot of her on the band. <laughs> I've got six copies of that album, um, Eric. You have the MoFi, don't you? Uh, <laughs> I've got a picture disc, I've got the splatter vinyl, I've got the MoFi, I've got the half speed master, I've got the original pressing, and then I've got the 180 gram remaster remix. <laughs> and if you ever want to see a really hilarious video watch their video for wires i really love that 
Have you ever seen that, Josh? Yes. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. They get the money yeah. from the company and they, they blow it all on beer and then they end up yep. cracking to it. And I love it. It's hilarious. But this is a great record. If you like the heavy stoner metal stuff, you'd love this record. So, Aaron, the first time I heard them was in concert. They opened up for Mastodon. And oh, I don't nice. know who they were, but everybody was like, you got to check out Red Fang. They might be better than Mastodon. And they killed. Like, I've never seen, you know, when you go to an opening act, it's like half full. I've never mm-hmm. seen a place full to capacity for the opening act because everybody was anticipating Red Fang. They, they had the buzz in Boston, you know, like it was it was awesome. And it, was it for this album they were on tour for or a different one? I believe so. I'll have to double check, but I believe it was that album, yep. Yeah, this is amazing. The, the yep. song number 13 is one of my favorites. It's just like an angst, angsty song. I just love it. Amazing. I love that band. So more, more Portland, uh, Jeff, come on. Well, no, no, but it's ironic because mine ties into your record because this is an artist oh. who also opened for Mastodon. <laughs> Back in the, the 2000s, um, David Gray, uh, I'm going with his album, uh, Slow Motion, Life in Slow Motion. Um, David Gray, you know, you talked about Billy Joel, um, you know, Josh, and, and David Gray, you know, he's very much, he's a piano player, basically, you know, in the tradition of Elton John and the tradition of Billy Joel and uh, the tradition of Leon Russell, you know, if you want to go so far. But he's also like a brilliant songwriter. He's a brilliant singer. Uh, I think he hails from Ireland, uh, if I'm not mistaken. But his album, it, it, it's one of those, each song has a distinctive melody. Uh, he incorporates some, you know, it's interesting because even though he's like a singer songwriter, he plays a piano. In some cases, he uses a, a drum machine on certain tracks, not so much on this album, but um, White Ladder. Uh, is an album. I think his most famous song is um, uh, I forget the the name of the the song at this moment. Um, I don't know. Anyway, I know it's pretty popular. I'll yeah. look it up. Yeah, yeah. I can't. I've. I've uh, oh, I, I've got. Well, anyway, his favorite song is uh, or his most famous song is Babylon um, off of the White Ladder. Uh, album most people would probably recognize that but he's got a great voice um you know and it's just really kind of mood music i guess you could say but um yeah i don't know it's just very cool if you like uh singer songwriters and you like piano based rock um it's one of those records I could just listen to over and over. It's very, uh, I don't know if have any of you heard of David Gray, any of his yeah. stuff? Okay. Um, yeah, so it's, it's really kind of, you know, it reminds me of a um, uh, little bit more of an alternative kind of a, a Billy Joel, I guess you could say. Um, but he's, you know, some of it's folky, some of it's Americana. But some of it's just straight power pop and it sounds great. And, um, you know, it's something you can put on and, uh, you know, easily connect with. And I awesome. think the, song, the title track, Life in Slow Motion, I think it was on an episode of ER, maybe. You know, it's one of those that um, it just lends itself to kind of like atmospheric, uh, you know, kind of like an epic uh, kind of a sound. But, all right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, if you like Mastodon, you'll like David Gray. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I like Mastodon. Uh, all right, so my next one is probably not going to be on anybody's list. They're one of my favorite bands of the last 20 years. Uh, the singer gets out shadowed by his other two bands. He's in three bands, and one of the bands is so not prolific. <laughs> one of the bands takes 14 years in between albums. Um, so he's got a lot of free time on his hands and he fills it with other albums. Uh, and this is probably my favorite album by them, which is Conditions of My Parole by Pusifer or Pusifer, depending on how you want to pronounce it. This is a fantastic album. The first album is very electronic and it turned a lot of people off. Um, but I will tell you that each album is decidedly different. It's so different. 
you can't judge if you like this like one plus for album a plus for album you might like the next so this album here um i would tell everyone what he does he chooses one instrument that kind of shapes the album and with this album the banjo definitely shapes the album not that it's a country album he just uses it in a sparse way it's still the elements of electronic music but um the song ocean it ends with oceans and tumbleweed and i listen to those um you have to listen to them together on the on the vinyl obviously but even if you have the cd you listen to them together uh the album is atmospheric jeff you would love it the lyrics are powerful his voice is powerful um every single song on here is great tiny monsters the green valley monsoon selling ghost horizons man overboard uh toma the rapture conditions of my parole condition of my parole is hilarious it's about some guy getting arrested for public intoxication public urination and uh he's telling the judge uh you can't lock me up because you know the warden may be a dracula or maybe a zombie it's just a drunken man's ramblings but it's hilarious <laughs> and it's awesome uh it's just a fantastic album i absolutely love it the next album money shot i like just as much and the money shots a, a heavier I would tell you that um, if you're a fan of Perfect Circle or a fan of Tool, Money Shot's probably their most popular because it's definitely their heaviest album. This is just more of a rock album with electronic elements. Uh, but I really love it. Uh, and it's my number five, Pucifer. The artwork looks like something um, Eagles of Death Metal would have. Uh... It does. Yeah. <laughs> have a great sense of humor oh my goodness when you go see them live like the last concert that i did the i saw them the opening act was mexican wrestling they had a wrestling ring and they had mexican wrestlers come out and then they came out and sang in the ring so they performed in the ring which was really cool um it's just a fantastic band i love tool tool will show up on my list later on but this is my favorite side project by maynard so does that kind of have a country-ish sound to it at times? At times. Like okay. So Go ahead. I, I, was watching, I was watching a TV show. I can't remember what it was. We had the subtitles on, and there was like two or three songs from that from them, and I imagine it's from that album. Because it was kind of a – I liked them, though. They were like almost a country -ish sound to them, but it said them as the artist that was doing it. Yeah. And I can't remember what it was. Yeah, dude, this album is more country. The next album is more hard rock. And the album after that is kind of more electronic. Um, so he just kind of lets the music take take him wherever he wants to go. Uh, you know, if you're into heavy metal, then listen to Duel. If you're into hard rock, listen to Perfect Circle. Pucifer is more uh, avant-garde, where each album changes. Yeah. But this one is really, really good. If I found an extra copy, I would send it to Aaron or, and Jeff. <laughs> Uh, because it is really good, and the and his voice is so good on this. With Tool, they tend to put, the, they want you to focus on the guitars and drums and bass. Mm -hmm. So his voice is never prominent on the Tool records. On these records, you can really hear how awesome his voice is. Kind of like Green Jelly. Yeah, Green Jelly. <laughs> he was in that band too. Or Jello. Green Jello. Yep. <laughs> yep. Cool. Well, my next album here is from 2000, year 2000. Second album by this band, and it ties into a few of the others. <laughs> but this is just such an amazing record. I had to put it in. This is Rated R from Queens of the Stone Age. My favorite album by them. Um, they became more popular with their, their follow-up, Songs from the Deaf. But to me, this is their best record. It's got Feel Good Hit of the Summer, which I kind of highlighted on one of my videos lately, the lyrics. And um, Boss Art Keeping a Secret which was in a movie soundtrack as well, but Monsters on Parasol. Uh, Nick Oliveri sings a couple songs like uh, Quick Into the Pointless. Uh, it's just an amazing record. This is one of the best records in the last 21 years, in my opinion. I love this album. And uh, Josh Homme, uh, his guitar work was never better. It was an amazing, amazing record. And um, there we go. I'm sure, Jeff, you got this coming up too. Yeah, I have that one. But I do have um, their first one, I think it is. Um, <laughs> Songs for the Deaf, is that? Uh, That's after this. Is it? Okay, all right. That's the one I've got. Yeah, but well, this one here I think is better, but they're both great. But this mm -hmm. here is just a groundbreakingly great album. Amazing. Yeah, I love that. I don't have it on vinyl, though. I have not been able to find it. Their stuff is hard to find. Yeah, I've got, I've got 
got rated R and uh, the red version, which is rated X. The same, right? It's the same record with different covers. I've got it. Nice. Well, and isn't the Walmart version called PG? Yeah. <laughs> and they it's took off the song. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they cut out, you know, all the lyrics. There's no, yeah. uh, they they totally removed the song. I think I got a head, um, I think I lost my headache with all that weird. <laughs> it almost makes you have a headache here in the end of that song. It's really strange, but yeah. yeah. Ten, they had to really cut down. Yeah, mm. but. <laughs> All right, well, I feel like all I'm showing today is singer-songwriters, you know, great singer-songwriters from the 2000s. And this is a band, and I call it band, but it's really, uh, you know, basically, you know, like Nine Inch Nails is a band, um, you know, and it's really Trent Reznor. This is a, a band, but it's really, um, you know, one singer-songwriter um, whose name at the at right now it escapes me, but uh, the band is called Bright Eyes. And this is the album, I'm Wide Awake, It's Morning. Um, and this is, uh, I don't know, it's just uh, kind of acoustic, uh, great melodies. Um, you know, on here, some country elements, like there's a lot of slide guitar. It's a little bit of like, if you cross Morrissey and Neil Young, uh, might be the best, best way to describe it, uh, because... Um, the singer uh, Connor Oberst is his name, uh, and he's essentially, I mean, Bright Eyes. Um, you know, he's really the only person in the band. I think it's like a revolving cast of musicians or whatever, but uh, Connor Oberst, um, his voice is a little bit like Morrissey. It's kind of an acquired taste, but his sound is very much um, like Neil Young. It's got kind of a, um, you know, like a country rock sound to it. Um, but it's great songwriting. Um, Train Underwater is a great track. One of my favorite songs on here. Um, First Day of My Life is actually a song that I played at my wedding. Um, you know, it's just great ballads, but also great um, country rock kind of an album. Um, got a vast catalog, but this is uh, definitely my favorite of his, I will say. So, Jeff, I almost chose Fever in Mirrors, which came out in 2000, which is my favorite by them. Um, and the song, The Calendar Hung Itself, to me is so haunting. I love that album. I discovered that album probably 10 years after it had come out, um, where one of my coworkers showed up and they left it at my desk. And they said, like, you need to own this album. And, uh, man, I fell in love with it. And you're right. That's an excellent album. I don't... I, you know, so many great albums in a short period of time with those guys. But fantastic. yeah, I think he put two albums out that year. Like this one that I showed you is um, more, I think, easily digestible. The other one that he put out, and I can't think of the name of it. It's a little more kind of like abrasive, uh, sonic, uh, you know, kind of like a little more Iggy Pop uh, than this album was. But, you know, still good. Worth checking out. Yeah, that year it was Digital Ash and a Digital Urn. Yeah, right? that's the one. Yeah, yeah. Yep. That was a good one too. Yeah, not for everybody, but you're right. Like more digestible probably. Yeah, um, yeah. All right, so the next one's not going to come as a surprise for anyone because hey, everybody that watches my channel knows that I love this artist. Uh, I discovered this artist on her first album, um, which is not the album I chose, but I someone had said, you need to hear the song Video Games. And this was probably about six months before the song blew up. And I heard it and I was like, I must have listened to that song 20 times in a single day. I just couple to it over and over again. And man, you guys know how much I love lyrics. Uh, and her lyrics are just so powerful. Her voice is not for everyone. Um, her music is not for everyone. Uh, but to me, she's just amazing and every album keeps getting better. And for a long time, my favorite album by hers was Ultra Violence. But what I've noticed is every Sunday morning, me and Michelle have the same ritual where we wake up before the kids get up. We I, I go grocery shopping. So it's done for the week. The grocery store is empty. I come back. I put on a record and I always start like Aaron starts with the blues on a Tuesday. I always start with Lana Del Rey. And I tend to now grab this album and it's. NFR, which stands for Norman fucking Rockwell. 
Um, and this is just, it was nominated for album of the year from the Grammys. This is not a pop record. It's not a record that could be played on the radio. A lot of her songs are very complex, very long. Um, they're not easily digestible. It's probably the reasons why I love her music. It makes you stop and listen. Um, she does have a cover on here, which is probably one of her most commercial songs. She does a cover of Doing Time, the Sublime song. Uh, but other than that, um, you know, there's songs on here that are like 10 minutes long, like Marina's Apartment Complex. Uh, but the song NFR, she's got a lyric where she says, you're just the man, that's just what you do. And the lyric cracks me up because we, as being a man, I know we do some stupid shit. And it's like, it's nice that she's just admitting it. <laughs> like, I just come to the realization you're going to do stupid shit because you're a man. Yeah. So like, yeah, that's what I do. I blow my paycheck on records. Uh, but she is a beautiful artist physically and uh, obviously uh, spiritually. She just got great music, a great voice and uh, just captivating. Uh, I love her music. And I think this has slid into my new favorite. Uh, but Ultraviolence is a close second. Uh, you know, Wild Go Right. Not for everybody, but she's definitely for me. Mm -hmm. It's so, so hard for me to hear Ultraviolence without thinking of Death Angel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I really sounded like Death Angel so that you would be like, I love Lana. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Ultraviolence is just such a great album. You're going to make me change my mind just showing that picture. And she's great to look at. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not bad, not bad on the eyes. No. <laughs> All right. Aaron, what you got? Up next, this album's from uh, 2018, it's a few years old. And to me, it's his best album he's done since the early 90s when he had a, another band after his first band. <laughs> this is from the Love of Metal, D. Snyder. This is the heaviest thing he's done since Under the Blade maybe heavier it's so good and when you first hear it when i first heard it, it's like oh yeah that's pretty good but after i heard it a few times especially after a few beers it just locked in with me and i can't stop listening to it still it's just amazing it's got a couple guest uh, guest stars on here um melissa white blood i think that's just her name she's a death metal singer from arch enemy she has a song but she sings with clean vocals it's really cool because she doesn't sing in a death metal voice and she has a really good voice, actually. It's uh, called Dead Hearts, Love Thy Enemy. Um, the guy, Howard Jones, not the not the synth pop Howard Jones, but Howard Jones from Killswitch Engage, does a song called uh, The Hardest Way, which is amazing. And so they're both singing. But it's just an amazing, the song American Made, one of the best D. Snyder songs ever. So is Running Mazes, um, you know, Tomorrow's No Concern. And the last song, For the Love of Metal, it's kind of like uh, going through all of the great metal songs and bands and it's one of those type but it's really cool and really heavy really great album this album i can't recommend it enough i know some people didn't like it when it came out because it was produced by um J J jamie josta has a new metal feel which i'm not a big fan of but this he did it really good on this amazing d snyder sounds great on it and he's never sounded better really and i just love this record when that album came out he did a signing at purchase three records Oh, nice. Yeah. So I, I, couldn't, I was working. Oh, so yeah, man. I couldn't go. But yeah, I mean, I, I was kicking myself that I could have met D. Yeah, this is it. I love this album. It's just, it's, I still listen to it at least once a month, ever since it came out. It's just, it kicks, it just energizes me every time I hear it. If you like that, you'll like a Widowmaker, huh? Yeah, if you like that, you'll like a band that's called Twisted Sister. <laughs> out in the 80s um stay hungry was probably their most popular album they had a couple of tracks on mtv we're not going to take it i want to rock um but very much in line with uh, a lot of d snyder d snyder sounds a lot like uh, twisted sister um, it does but yeah if you like d snyder check out twisted sister um, <laughs> i love that sister. yeah yeah no they're they're a great band look them up on uh wikipedia um, all right, so I would feel like I'm the yin to Aaron's yang, every album that I pick. I don't know why it is. Like, Aaron picks, like, this cool, heavy shit, and then I'm in here with my synth pop stuff. But So I'm going again, like, 
so basically this band is like the 2000 reincarnation of craft work it's synth pop but it's not disco it's not dance music you know i'm not going to scare people off from it by you know it is not it doesn't have a beat it doesn't have a disco beat it's not electronica it's all synthesizers but it is some of the most melodic pop rock that you will ever hear. And it's a band called Air. And this is their album. It's called Talkie Walkie. And it's a duo. They're like the Black Keys, but they're the synth pop version of the Black Keys. And I don't know what country they're from. I should have done my research for this video. But it is... Probably at the top of my, this may be my favorite album post 2000. It is um, everything I, I, I like about um, electronic synth pop music, but it's done so well. They put out, a, I don't know, they probably got six or seven albums out. This is definitely my favorite. And, um, you know, it's European, but it is done in such a way that I, I love it. They've got a track on here called Mike Mills, which I always thought was like, oh, R.E.M. Mike Mills. It's not. It's a different Mike Mills. But um, some of it's instrumental. Some of it has vocals, but it's very atmospheric. It's very, um, you know, it, it would make great soundtrack music, but it's all keyboards. It's all synthesizers. It's all electronic music, but it's so gorgeous. It's so beautiful. It's just great, uh, you know, even if you're not like a, a synth pop band, you can put that on and I guarantee uh, you would like it. I can't say enough positive things about it, but it is, um, it's like new wave synth pop craft work for a new generation, I guess is maybe the best way I would describe it, but um, just fantastic and love that album. Cool. Nice. And neither of you have so, probably heard it. I have not, but you have me interested. And I'm telling you, I'm going to download it on Apple Music. I will let you yeah, check it out. Like I say, check it out. It is so unique and it's so cool. And it's so, you know, it's one of those. And I'm a big melody guy. Like, I don't listen to a whole lot to lyrics. I mean, I will, but it's just got hooks. Every song's got a hook and it'll like drag you in. And one of the, like, there's a song on here called Run, like, for instance, and it's got this, like, processed vocal a little bit, and it's just, you know, it's like this, I don't know, it, it's so very craft work, but it's so very cool the way that they do it, um, but I'm going to let you listen, check it out on Spotify, and let me know in the comment section what you think. All right, guys, so my next album I do not own on vinyl. It's like a $500 vinyl. Uh, I'm desperately in search of it. I have it downloaded on Apple Music. Um, so I discovered this next artist with his first band, The Smiths, in the 80s, which I was absolutely in love with, The Smiths. Um, and, you know, it showed how crazy of a, of a youth I was, that I love The Smiths and I love Slayer. Right. Uh, but that being said, Phil Ensemble of Pantera says Smith is in his top five favorite bands of all time. So, you know, I loved Morrissey's vocals. I love the Smiths. And when he went solo, I continued to love him. And I absolutely positively loved, to me, in the 90s, his Zenith was your arsenal. To me, that was his, his best. I know the next album, he had a huge hit with The More You Ignore Me the closer I get. But to me, your arsenal was his best. And I was like, okay, we're never going to get a better solo album from Morrissey because in 1997, he came out with Maladjusted, which was good, but it wasn't, it didn't sell as well as the others. And he took seven years, seven years between Maladjusted and the next album, which is You Are the Quarry right there. This album, to me, stands up with any Smiths album. It is so fantastic. Uh, it's got some heavy songs, believe it or not, Aaron. I'll send you some of the songs. Irish Blood, English Heart is a hard rocking song. Um, it's fantastic. First in the Gang to Die. Uh, but I love every song on this album. The song I'm Not Sorry is one of my favorite songs Morrissey ever did. 
but he ends the album with a song called You Couldn't Last. And this is when I really knew I loved this album. The song I Know I Couldn't Last is so honest, where he starts talking about, I knew I couldn't be big forever, like almost admitting that this is over. Like, I knew this couldn't last. I knew I couldn't keep up with the record sales, that the kids will consume you and then they'll destroy you. And that's essentially what he says. What Morrissey didn't realize is this album, it rejuvenized his career. He was once again selling out huge auditoriums around the country. He was always big in England, but once again, selling out big places in the United States. And for the next 20 years, up until today, where he's doing a Las Vegas residency, he's been really, he's been back to a status where I think people take him somewhat seriously. He sticks his foot in his mouth and is, he's his own worst enemy, worst enemy. But I really love this album. Uh, and I feel it's just as good as any Smith's album. And it's definitely my favorite solo Morrissey album. There's nothing even close to it. He's like the new wave Roger Waters. I mean, when it comes down to it, you know, he doesn't care what he says. He doesn't care who he pisses off. He's got his political views. He's taken some shit over the years, like Bengali and Platforms is maybe his most controversial song off of Viva Hate. Some of yeah. his, you know, Smith lyrics, he's taken some heat over. But, you know, yeah, I would agree. I think he's a musical genius. I think he, his music um, transcends just regular new wave alternative pop music. Um, and yeah, I mean, Everything you said and more, I think Morrissey is, uh, you know, a living legend. Um, you know, he's like, I mean, he was very much influenced by glam rock. You know, the New York Dolls, David Bowie uh, were his idols. And he's kind of carried that torch forward. Um, you know, and he's very self-aware. He's very cheeky. He's very um, kind of, uh, you know, he's kind of a diva a little bit, you might say. Um, but I think, you know, he's always kept up with the times and he's never strayed too far from his work with the Smiths. Um, but you know, he's also, I don't know, I, I would love to eventually see him live one day, but, um, that, yeah, I had to and he canceled. Yeah. He's, he's had so many concerts. Yeah. Like your arsenal was kind of a comeback album and your yeah. It was a comeback album for him, but, you know, it introduced him, I think, to a, a new generation of fans also because that album was so solid. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. And you probably got a Morrissey album right now, too. <laughs> this, yeah, this album has no synth, no synthesizers. <laughs> so I don't know if I can show. It's just a total rock album. Even Maiden has since now. This one doesn't. <laughs> I don't think. I'm pretty sure this doesn't have sense. This is from uh, 2013. And what this is, is this is Vista Chino with Peace. And this is the last of my albums that kind of connect. And what this is, is Caius without Josh Homme, basically. It's uh, John Garcia and Nick Oliveri and um, Ramp York back. And it's basically a Caius album. But they got into a big legal battle with Josh Homme over the name. So they had to change the name to Vista Chino. They chose Vista Chino. And this album is so great. It's right up with any Caius album. It's amazing. Um, they did a song called, um, where is it? Dragona Dragona, which is amazing. But my favorite thing on here is a really pretentious song. <laughs> not, really, not pretentious, but it's just got all these different changes. And it's called Acidize the Gambling Moose. And it's a 10 minute song. And it's just, it goes from one thing to another, and it's just an amazing piece of music. It's a, and this whole album is amazing. Great, great record. Really strange artwork. <laughs> but the band is just solid. It's, I mean, this could have been another Caius record from, you know, very strange artwork in it. But there's the band. Now, Aaron, so is that another one that's going to cost me hundreds of dollars, or will I be able to find that? I don't think this is too cheap anymore either. <laughs> Luckily, right. I would really come out because I'm such a big fan. But this yeah. Mr. Cheap record is just, I tried to play this on Tips and Tuesday and it wouldn't go through. It was getting blocked. So I have okay. tried. <laughs> but Ask the Guys the Gambling Moose, check that song out. Um, Mass Vino is amazing. You know, Barcelonian. 
Adara is just has all these hooks, six in your head. And it's kind of like an acoustic guitar thing and you get rocks out. But uh, absolutely no synth. It's just all rock. <laughs> <laughs> this no is like synth. the top of the Jeff's, Jeff's uh, last couple of records. But, you know, I can appreciate his and this. They're both equally good, just totally different. So I would love, I would love the hype stick of said no synth. <laughs> like um, Tesla used to put no machines on all their records. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. it was just all straight instrumentation. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, my as an ar uh, artist, actually, I know Aaron likes. Yes. So, all right. <laughs> um, you know, that's going to be a first. But uh, an artist that really technically had a, what I consider kind of a novelty hit in the 90s. Um, alternative, but still... You know, sort of a novelty hit. Uh, you wouldn't have expected him to con continue to have a career to this day uh, based on the first hit that he had. The song that he had was a song called Loser. Um, and, you know, it was kind of like stoner rock, kind of like, oh, ha ha, whatever. You know, you figure this guy would not have had shelf life more than, you know, beyond 1995. And yet he won a Grammy award. I mean, he's still putting out music today and I'm talking about Beck, obviously. And the album that I'm gonna pick from him is Huerto, 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 however you pronounce it. Um, but I love this album. I mean, it is, and Beck has a lot of great albums, but you know, he's got so many different styles and elements on this record. Um, Beck is able to transcend so many different genres, you know, and he takes it, he makes it his own and he adapts it. And he, um, you know, this one is, um, yeah, I don't know. Like there's no, you, you can't define what Beck does because each song sounds a little bit different. He, I mean, he kind of like has a rap song, but it doesn't sound like rap. You know, like the song, um, K Onda Wero, um, you know, it's just kind of got this like lazy Latin little beat to it. And he, uh, I don't know, like whatever Beck does for me, it like turns to gold. He can, you know, he, he always comes out with like kind of an acoustic album. And then he comes out with, you know, like, um, uh, probably, you know, most people back in the 90s, um, you know, they, his album uh, is probably the album that most people know. And that was, um, you know, sort of like, OK, I'm here to stay like Loser was not just a phenomenon. It wasn't a novelty track. It wasn't a one hit wonder. And then he came out with Mutations, which is totally out of left field. It's totally acoustic. It's just very kind of subdued. There's a little, there's a bossa nova track on here. But other than that, it's sort of like the total antithesis of Odelay. And then, you know, he comes out with this one, which is um, Midnight Vultures, which is kind of a take on funk rock. And then he comes out with another acoustic one, which is Sea Change. Um, you know, so he's always kind of like balancing that. And then with Weirdo, I, it's like all over the board, but it all works. It's all inventive. It's all brilliant. And, um, you know, I don't know. Like, I, Beck is one of the few artists, like, I, you know, he comes out with an album and I'll buy it without hearing a single track off of it because it's going to be good. And although his last album was kind of horse shit, but, you know, that was like the first one where like, ah, uh, I don't know, but... I don't know. Beck is Beck. I really like his guitar work too. Yeah. Yeah. And like especially with the yard birds. Yeah. Oh, Aaron. <laughs> not not Jeff Beck. <laughs> not I, Jeff I, Beck. I, I like that. He's cool. Yeah. I love that song. I love the album Sea Change. That to me is his masterpiece, but oh, you yeah. know, it's so good. But yeah, you know, it's funny, I was, you know, for the viewers, I was telling Jeff before the video started that I, I didn't choose certain bands hoping he would choose Beck, Radiohead, Death Cab, uh, you know, those bands, I could have chosen so many of their albums, um, you know, so thank you, Jeff, for choosing. One I love, like Black Tambourine, it's just like boom, 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 boom. 
boom, boom, boom. You know, it's just such a, a cool track. And then he gets a little, you know, guitar in there and, um, you know, it all works. It's brilliant. You know, I mean, he chases trends, but he does it in such a way, like he totally like makes it convincing and he makes it his own. And, um, you know, there's no, I mean, you can't compare Beck albums because none of them are like, I mean, you might say, well, sea change is like a little bit like mutations, but still there's enough difference there. He's always evolving. He's always coming up with creative ways to, you know, make new music and there's no signature Beck sound. He's a, he's like a chameleon. He's always adapting to, uh, you know, different styles of music. And he, he, it's a, he's a um, Scientologist, but you know, other than that, um, <laughs> I think he's great. Yeah, and you know what? Even though his last album you didn't love, there was one song on it that I did love. But I give the guy credit for constantly trying to evolve and change. Yeah, like I even dreams, you know, dreams. Like okay, like I, I get it, you know. And it was sort of like I mean, it's so different from um, you know, morning phase, which yeah. morning phase was like you know, wow, that's such a brilliant album and then he goes off and makes dreams which is like a you know almost like a teeny bopper pop album but it, it still works on many levels but then like the last album he put out it just lost me and i'm like like shit you know like well i'm not gonna be a beck fan anymore if he's gonna be putting out stuff like that but um everything up to the point i was on board with his next album would be completely different you know, I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. It better be. It better be. <laughs> good. Yeah. Well, like, whatever. Like, I'm threatening Beck. Like, he gives a shit. <laughs> Listen, Beck, your next album better be whatever. But all right. So, my next album, my number two album, is one of my favorite bands. There's no doubt about it. Uh, they don't have a bad album in their catalog, bad album in their catalog. Um, I could have chosen any of their albums in the last 20 years, but I'm just going to choose this one. And that is the band Tool. Um, they are just amazing, absolutely amazing band. Um, you know, I get on these Tool kicks where I'll just listen to them for a few days. Um, you know, very progressive, as you guys know. Um, their first few albums weren't as progressive, but I really love it. I mean, the sounds that they create and the feel of the music and if you've ever got a chance to see them live it is a life-changing experience uh you know when they you go see them live Maynard actually is most of the time behind the stage without even a spotlight on him and the and you really focus on the lights the music the the rhythm of the drums I mean Danny Carey is just like one of the greatest drummers that's ever existed um you know, they just have an ambiance to their music and I cannot get enough of it. I love absolutely all of their albums. Um, it's so funny that like, sometimes I think like, man, Josh, you love the misfits that create these one minute and 58, seven, 58 second songs that are pure aggression, you know, or you listen to, you know, any hard rock band like Van Halen, which crafts these songs that are so polished and so, so digestible. And then you love bands like this, which create music that really makes you, the average listener probably would turn the dial, you know, but I love, love, love Tool. Out of all the progressive bands, they're my favorite, and it's probably because they're steeped in heavy metal. Uh, and this is just one of their albums from the last 20 years, but any of the three albums that they released in the last 20 years are fantastic. So. Well, and Tool is not a band that you just put on in the background and you kind of go about your business. I mean, you have to actually pay attention to the music. And if you're going to enjoy Tool, you know, you have to focus. You, you can't have, you know, you're not just going to have them on the background. You're going to actually have to give them your undivided attention and pay attention to the music. But yeah, Tool is one of those bands. I mean, they're so, you know, they've never put out a bad album. You know, they're not an album, they're not a band that, um, uh, you know, is, um, you know, I don't know. I don't know what I'm trying to say, but basically, you know, Tool is, I, I mean, is it unfair to call them a little bit like progressive rock in some 
I would definitely say they're progressive rock. Yeah, they're yeah. an album band. They're not a song band. They're like, not going to be on the radio. I guess as I'm trying to say, that you're never going to hear them on the radio. You're never going to be like, oh, is that Tool? <laughs> you know, yeah, I mean, it's some, I think yeah. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. That was on the radio a lot. What's that? Silver was on the radio quite Silver, a bit. Yeah, the first two albums were more straight up alt rock leanings towards heavy metal and then they got more progressive as they went on uh they do have songs that are commercially viable i feel but that's not why we're listening to them but you're absolutely right if you just especially aaron with your brand new needle that you got for your turntable if you go play a tool record and you start listening to the separation of the instruments and how they somehow work so well together but they're creating this you know, especially for our genre of music. I mean, heavy metal music is loud, it's fast. A lot of times, you know, the music, the bass is following what the drummer is doing. Um, it's more about a feeling than the, the actual individual instruments. With Tool, I feel like you're getting an experience. It's like a psychedelic experience. But yeah, I love it. Yeah. I actually do have that. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. I, I, Tool supposedly is going to release a box set of all their albums. I would love oh, to happen. Yeah. Is yours the uh, the picture disc of this? It is, unfortunately, but it still sounds good. Uh, yeah. Of all the own, it's one of the better ones. Yeah, that's uh, just what it's like. Yeah, supposedly they're going to release audiophile editions of all their albums, but you know, I love their music. I've always loved their music. It's not what I. It's not what I gravitate all the time. Gravitate to all the time. I mean, obviously that, you know, most times, like if I'm sitting there like, oh, I want to listen to something heavy, it's much easier to put on a Danzig record. <laughs> you know what I mean? We're just going to be like a four minute song than an 18 minute song that takes up an entire side of a record, you know, so. Cool. <laughs> but, you know, that's it. Tool, they were number two. Right. That's you a guys good one. know what number one's going to be. Well, we'll get to that later. I know what it is. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Just like you know. probably know my number one. <laughs> It'll be a big surprise. Yeah. But my number two is a synth pop masterpiece from 2011. <laughs> Worship Music from Anthrax. Love this album. Um, you know, I love all Anthrax records. I don't think they put out a bad album. I don't. I even love, I love the John Bush era, but this is when, when Joey Belladonna came back on this record, and this one just had a new, fresh energy to it. Stuff like The Devil You Know, and, you know, um, Earth on Hell, Fight Until You Can't, I'm Alive. Every song just is so killer, and they even have Crawl, which is really different for them. Really cool, different song. And I like the interludes. They have little interludes in between the songs on these. So they're really cool. It's really different, like a, a drum thing and a, just all these different things. This this album is my favorite Anthrax album, probably since Among the Living. I love this record. And it's just so amazing. Um, even the, uh, the cover song, New Noise, is really good, too, on here. So, I love that record. It, yeah, it's... An, I mean, I mean, this record here, For All Kings, is a great record, too, but I think this is far superior, and I think this is the best thing they've done since the 80s, and I love all their albums. So. But, I, I agree, and I feel like that album was so good, there was no way For All Kings was going to live up to it, because it was like, Anthrax is back, you know, it was yeah. that feeling of, and I love John Bush, I'm not trying to disparage it, yeah, that album was so mind-blowing, I went and saw him on that tour, and I had seen them three or four times with John Bush, but never got to see him with Joey. And Joey looked identical. <laughs> that was the crazy thing. You know, I was like, holy shit. Uh, and it was, they were awesome. And that album is so killer. And I probably told this story in my video, but one day I went to go grab that album and I forgot when I sold my collection that I had sold it. You know, oh. I had sold all the Anthrax albums. And I was like, holy shit, I don't own this album. And I ran out and bought it. Uh, because that's just a classic. Every Anthrax fan needs to own that album. Yeah. And uh, I actually saw them with with uh, Joey Belladonna opening for Kiss back in the 80s, late 80s. And then I saw them with John Bush, too. And they were, they were great both times. Amazing. Yeah. So, and you're right, Joey Belladonna, he still sounds, he has a soaring vocals. 
Yeah. And, and what was cool about him, he was a uh, heavy metal guy, but he was into stuff like Journey and Kansas and vocally uh, influenced by them. So it brought a different thing to the thrash music that made them stand out over the other thrash bands. The so vocally, they were a little different than like Megadeth, Metallica, Slayer. Yeah. Where, you know, he had the soaring vocals, but they were steeped into the classic rock and made them unique. But that's yep. a great there. Love it. My first day of high school, I wore a Spreading the Disease concert shirt. And I told Scott Ian that when I met him. I was like, Scott, like I have a picture of me and Scott. I was like, my first day of high school, I wore a Spreading the Disease concert shirt. And he was like, okay, dude. <laughs> like, who cares? <laughs> but I was like, dude, you don't understand how important your band was to me, you know? But yeah, um, and then I uh, I yelled at him because the John Bush albums weren't on vinyl. This was like two years yeah. ago. And he was like, no, dude, they're coming, they're coming. But yeah. Yeah, I have so, them all now. <laughs> now we have them all. Yeah, I only had Sound of White Noise and now I have all of them. So. Great stuff. I'm only missing spreading the disease. All right, Jeff's heard enough about anthrax. Go ahead, Jeff. <laughs> all good, man. All right, so <laughs> for my next pick, you know, and I'm a, I'm a big Beatles fan. I'm a big Beach Boys fan. And the thing about, you know, when I talk about the Beatles and the Beach Boys, it's always like, you know, look what progression they made over the course of just a short period of time. You know, like for the Beatles, you know, essentially seven or eight years, you know, the progression from Love Me Do all the way to, you know, Abbey Road in the space of, you know, it was essentially like eight years time. It's like mind blowing, you know, same with the Beach Boys, you know, from, you know, basically, uh, you know, surfing, safari, and then you're into like pet sounds and smile in the space of like four years. And I would always kind of lament, like there's no bands today where you get that kind of progression where, you know, they're here and then two albums later, they're like totally like off in another direction. They're inventing new you know musical language and they're totally like making like progressions beyond where they started from and this next band is a, a band that i feel like you know you never knew with with each release what you were going to get and they were always like raising the bar as far as you know where they were going to go and i'm talking about radiohead you know radiohead their first album pablo honey was very much straight you know the the big single was creep but it was kind of, you know, alternative stuff, not that different from stuff you heard on the radio. And then the bands kind of took it a notch farther. You know, the the um, songwriting um, was a bit better and, you know, they got a bit more aggressive, but it was still very much a, a, a guitar based record. And then they came out with OK Computer and totally it was like, holy shit, where did this come from? Like, this is a masterpiece. And then they came out with Kid A, which was completely out of left field, sounded nothing like OK Computer. You know, it was electronic, but it was just so like, holy shit, my mind is blown. Where did this come from? And But the album that I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with Amnesiac. Um, and, you know, Radiohead is one of the few bands where you can say with each album, it's a progression from the album before. And, you know, they weren't just going to be like, well, we could have easily just kept putting out albums that sounded like the Benz and they would have been successful. Tom York is a great songwriter. You know, he, he's got a lot of melody. Radiohead is a very accomplished band. But, you know, it's like, no, we're going to keep upping the ante. You know, you've got like the first track, you know, packed like sardines uh, is just like you know, that's different. And then, you know, Pyramid Song is just kind of like it starts piano based um, and then it kind of builds like a little bit. But, um, you know, this album for me, you know, it's kind of like a, and I always call it like a sister album to Kid A. And, you know, Josh and I were talking about the fact that in November, Radiohead is actually reissuing the albums um, together, Kid A and Amnesiac. Um, you know, but this one, it, it doesn't disappoint. It's, it's inventive. They've got a different version um, on here of uh, the Morning Bell, which, you know, is completely different from the version that's on Kid A. Um, but it's, you know, they're incorporating electronic elements. Tom York is doing different things with his voice. 
they're still, you know, they can rock hard in places, but it's just so unexpected. And the, the places that they take you are so, um, you know, kind of out in left field and you never know what you're going to get with Radiohead. And they're always kind of confounding expectations. And well, you think we're this well with the next album, we're totally gonna, you know, hopefully you stay with us, but it reminds me a lot of like the Beatles, like their progression from rubber soul to revolver from revolver to Sergeant Pepper, you know, they kept like, you know, well, we're going to keep, you know, going a step farther and, um, you know, we're not going to stay in the same place. And that's what I think of Radiohead. They're one of the few bands that constantly kind of reward your loyalty with them because they're always going to be interesting. They're not going to be boring. Um, you know, it's not going to be like Dave Matthews band where, while well, you buy a Dave Matthews band album, you know what you're going to get. It's going to be like, you know, the same thing pretty much every single album of Radiohead, you don't know what you're going to get. You're going to buy a radio album. Like what the hell are they doing now? You know, they could be doing like, you know, Gregorian chants or, you know, something also crazy out of left field. But, um, you know, I, I had to have one Radiohead album and that's the one that I picked. Jeff, I almost feel like Radiohead's worst album is their first album. Uh, like, I feel like they just constantly got better. My friend always says that Pink Floyd is our, I mean, Radio has our generation's Pink Floyd uh, in the sense of early Pink Floyd before they they gained commercial success, uh, you know, where they were constantly just like, well, we're just going to play this music and we hope that you guys understand it, um, which is, you know, goes against the grain. Once you taste success, most people want to chase that success with them. They go in a completely opposite direction direction uh i'm so glad you picked radiohead because i could have picked any of their albums in the last 20 years i love moon shape cool as much as i love kid a they're just i love all their albums um you know but i would say that when i was doing this and thinking who i would choose for radiohead um you're absolutely right like it was hard to pick kid a or amnesiac because to me they're brother and sister albums so I was like, okay, well, I can't pick both of those. Maybe I'll pick uh, In Rainbows or maybe I'll pick Moonshape Pool. Uh, but you're absolutely right. I mean, any of those albums are just awesome. Love them. Yeah, no, you can't go wrong. So um, my number one is really hard to describe why I love them. So, and let me try to, to bottle this up. Um, so if you said to me, Josh, who's your favorite artist of all time? Uh, I love, you know, Tom Waits, Tom Petty, Bruce Springsteen, Iron Maiden, Danzig, if you count Sam, Danzig, Sam Hain, um, The Misfits. I love Slayer, Metallica, uh, you know, uh, The Four Horsemen, all of these hard rocking bands and rock and roll bands, um, Tool. And this band that is my current favorite band doesn't really fit into those genres and the best way I could describe it is I went and saw them live and it's just like Tipsy Tuesday where everybody is hammered and they're singing along and the lyrics mean something to them. So when Aaron is singing along and he's singing these lyrics and you feel it, you're like, it's infectious. And that's what I love about Tipsy Tuesday. And that's why I tune in every week, no matter what's going on. I keep my girlfriend up. I'm like, what are you doing Tipsy Tuesday? This band is a walking, talking Tipsy Tuesday. If I could take every one of my friends to go see them live, they would love this band. And that's Lucero. This is their four LP live box set. If the house was on fire and the kids were safe, this is the one thing I would grab. Um, this album is four albums of absolute craziness. Just people rocking out. You can hear the, the, the crowd screaming and singing along. The, it's like a house party. Um, their lyrics are fantastic. They sing heartfelt lyrics, just like Springsteen. They sing or Tom Petty or Rockers of Old. So their lyrics are great, but they're just four normal or five normal dudes now that I've had a keyboard. It's five normal dudes. They look like truck drivers. So that's the best way to describe it. And they go up there and the singer does not have like a crazy, beautiful voice. Um, He's got a rough voice, like he's been drinking whiskey his whole life. Their music has all, they started off as a punk rock band, believe it or not. And then they turned into kind of alt country. Because I think that um, the singer, Ben, 
he loves artists like Springsteen and, you know, 70s type of rock and roll. And that's what he desired to do. So they kind of went away from the punk rock and went to an alt rock slash country feel. Uh, but they can't be described. And this box set is out of print. It's like a $300 box set. But if they put this back in print tomorrow, Aaron, Jeff, Chris, and Gary, you would all own it. Because I would I would go and spend the $200 it would cost me to buy all of you this box set just so that you would own it. And I could be like, did you fuckers listen to this album? <laughs> it's awesome. And if you yeah. hated it, tell me. <laughs> I don't need to know. Uh, but maybe one day they'll play Boston and you guys will come visit and we'll go see them live and you guys will understand. It's a drunken mess. They, even the band gets drunk. When you go see them live, like people are constantly bringing shots to the band and they're, they've been kicked out of bars that they're playing in and they had to be let back in because they were too intoxicated. Not that they, they perform like sloppy drunk. They perform well. I think they perform well intoxicated. Uh, but they're just, it's a drunken house party, much like Tipsy Tuesday. There you go. That's a special, yeah, that is a special skill. Performing What's intoxicated that? is a special skill you need to develop <laughs> over time. Many years yep. of practice. <laughs> so there's a punk rock band, the punk rock bar in Boston called, um, oh my God, the Middle East. It's famous. It's a tiny little hole in the wall that a lot of famous bands have played there before they started. And they were talking, I was talking to the singer of Lucero, and he's like, yeah, we're at the bar downstairs, we're getting hammered drunk, and they kick us out. We show up, and they said, hey, we kicked you guys out. They're like, we're the band, we're playing. So they, all right, well, you come back in. They played the show, they played like a two-hour show. After the show, they get, they're drinking more, they get kicked out again. He goes, I think we're the only band that get kicked out twice in one day in the living room. <laughs> so yeah, just awesome band so much fun they're down to earth the great music uh my favorite band the last 20 years and uh you know just go check them out lucero they're awesome yeah they are you gave me a record of them i do like that it's good i like awesome. that yeah now this my band is my favorite band my last my number one and listening to you guys talk about radiohead and lucero they're kind of a combination of them but a little heavier but just um, they they constantly are changing. They never stay in one place, but always sounds like them. Very down to earth guys. You would you know you just see them in a store. You wouldn't even know they were rock stars or something. They've been the same guys forever. I'm choosing Blast Tyrant from Clutch. This album is so good, and this is probably the pinnacle of what they've done. I mean, every one of their albums they kind of change and go through different phases. But this one here, they, it just all came together. And as soon as I heard it for the first time, I knew it was going to be one of my favorite records ever. And it still is. And it's just a beast of a record. They just reissued it with another cover. It was really amazing. And um, it's, it sounds pretty close to how it sounds on here. But I mean, the lyrics are so unique. The music is just all over the, you know, it's just not like anyone else, really. You know, they, they take all these different elements, but it always sounds like them. And, uh, you know, Subtle Hustle is one of my favorite songs and Ghost. And you were saying you like La Curandera a lot, which is a great yeah. song. This is almost a concept album. I mean, it's got this like big theme going all the way through it of a story. And it's just uh, an amazing record. You know, the stuff like The Mob Goes Wild and Cypress Grove. Cypress Grove is so unique for them. And, uh, you know, Worm Drink is, I call it the modern day uh, Where Was It London kind of has that same au thing you know <laughs> i love that song and this to me is uh it's actually not my favorite clutch record but i think it might be their best record my favorite is probably pure Oak fury because it's a little i don't know just just the first one i got into but this album here um if nobody if you haven't heard this album check it out it's so unique they even have a song called the regulator that they played on the the tv show the walking dead and one of the episodes, I think it was in Nebraska, the episode of Nebraska is where they're at the farm at the end of the show they were playing. It's pretty cool. But uh, yeah, it's just one of my favorite albums of all time. And I had to put a clutch record. And I really could have done this with all clutch records, but I wanted to not only use an artist once. So but there we go. Last time. I feel like, you know, I've listened to, listened to that so many times that you bought it for me. Like it would have made my list if I had been able to digest it longer. You know, it's just, I, I love it. 
I absolutely love it. Every song is fantastic on that album. Uh, but I feel like I've been living with it for s- such a short period of time, you know? Yep. So, yeah. Yeah, I've been living with it since uh, 2004. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Serious, I don't think a month has gone by since then. I haven't heard it at least once. So, it's awesome. Yeah, it's a great record. And it grows on you. The more you hear it, you'll notice more things. It just has so much going on. It'll keep growing and growing and growing on you. Even though if you like it at first, it never gets old. One well, it's records. funny that I told that to Michelle that, like, you know, we ha- actually had that conversation where I listened to it around the day you bought it for me, and I absolutely loved it. And then I was like, a couple of days later, I'm like looking for an album. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go listen to that again. Mm-hmm. And the second time I was like, even though I loved it the first time, I was like, wow, it's dramatically better. Even though yeah. I loved it the first time. Like, I, how can it be so much better when I loved it the first time? And then I listened to it again. And I was like, this keeps getting better. Like, I couldn't believe how much I loved it. Um, and I'm sure if I, if I went and played it tomorrow, it would still grow. Because you notice yeah. different lyrics are so unique. And you're like, oh, that fucking line was so killer. Or that, that guitar riff was so killer. Uh, yeah, they definitely have a lot of elements like Radiohead, like you said, where they're changing. Like when I listen to their modern stuff, it doesn't really sound like Blast Iron, but it's still yeah. good. And their older stuff almost has a punk feel to it. And then yeah. they had like a space rock feel. And then they have, I mean, they just keep changing. Every album is a little different. They never, yeah. you never know exactly what it's going to be, but it always has their sound. And um, their guitarist is so underrated. He um, he's such a riff master. I mean, they've done so many albums. He has so many. He's almost like the modern day uh, Tony Iommi, where just endless riffs that are that are uh, catchy and memorable. It's just amazing the riffs he does. Yeah, Lucer opened up for um, Clutch, and they interviewed Ben, the singer Lucer, when he said he was nervous because you know Clutch fans. Like they only want to hear clutch, you know, <laughs> but to the tour, he said that the clutch fans greeted them so nicely because they were so diverse. Like their fans yeah. were so there's such a wide range of music um, that he was shocked that they were treated so nicely. You know, he was like, he, he thought it was going to be like opening for Slayer where it's like, okay, these people are going to fucking hate us. And <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's the cool. thing about clutch though. They have so many different musical styles mixed into their music that the fans of them will appreciate almost anybody because they, they, you know, incorporate hard rock, heavy metal, jazz, you know, funk, um, you know, any kind of, you know, a little country, a little uh, blues. It's just, it's everywhere. They got like every style mixed in together. All right, Jeff, what is your number one? I'm excited. All How right. You have- well, my number one, you know, and I talked about Radiohead, the fact that they are constantly evolving, they're constantly reinventing themselves, and they're exploring new musical territory. And I would say the same about this band. Um, this is a band that started out there very much alt country. They kind of, um, the singer songwriter uh, for this band, he came from a band that was called Uncle Tupelo. Um, They broke up and then he formed a new band called Wilco. And I'm talking, of course, about Jeff Tweedy. And this is um, an interesting album because it was actually rejected by the album, by the record company is not commercial enough. There was a lot of controversy because they rejected the album and said, this album is not going to sell, which I have no idea why, because I think it's their most accessible, most commercial sounding album. And I'm talking about Yankee. Hotel Foxtrot, Wilco, and I, I love this because, you know, I uh, I don't know, many, many episodes ago, we did a, a video where we talked about, you know, five albums that were, we recommended, and one of the albums I recommended was an album by Eels, and the song that we all kind of connected with was called, um, I'm Going to Stop Pretending That I Didn't Break Your Heart, and the lead off track on here is called I am trying to break your heart um so sort of like kind of like you know an interesting uh take on you know the whole heartbreak uh message there but they've also got a song on here called heavy metal drummer and one of the lines is playing kiss covers beautiful and stone you know it's about kind of like reminiscing about these bands that he used to listen to these heavy, heavy metal bands growing up and they all all used to play you know heavy metal songs and kiss 
uh, songs as well. You know, and kind of like a fond reminiscing of that. It's one of my favorite tracks on this album. But, you know, you got interesting titles like Jesus, etc. Um, Ashes of American Flags. You know, and this is an album that came out after 9-11, although the song was recorded before the events of 9-11. So it's kind of got, you know, that irony about it. But, um, yeah, Hooko are one of those bands. You never know what you're going to get with each successive album. Jeff Tweedy is constantly... Um, you know, he's challenging himself. They're constantly coming up with new styles. And I've seen them live a couple of times. And, you know, they're a little bit Grateful Dead. They're a little bit alt country. They're a little bit, uh, you know, experimental rock. You know, uh, a Ghost is Born, which is the album that came out after this. It's got some pretty abrasive, almost like Lou Reed metal machine music kind of moments on it where it's like, what the fuck? is this you know but jeff tweedy he doesn't give a shit he's going to put out whatever music he wants to put out he's not trying to chase trends he doesn't care if it's commercial or not he just records music that he likes music that um you know he wants to record some of it sounds like neil young some of it sounds totally off in left field but you know for me this is still my favorite wilco album um you know, one of their albums is actually called um, Schmilko, which is a reference to, you know, Nielsen Schmielsen. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, Wilco. And again, it's one of those like bands. Oh, they're hipster. Uh, you know, people kind of dismiss them because they think, well, it's just pretentious hipster rock. But, you know, I disagree. I think uh, Wilco is one of the best bands of the 2000s. So there. And that is one of their best albums. There's no doubt. And I love that, that album. And my funny Wilco story is this, is that I'm a huge Neil Young fan. You guys know that. And Neil Young was coming to the Worcester Centrum. And my dad doesn't go to a lot of concerts anymore. He's not in very great shape. But uh, I know he loves Neil Young. So his dad, let's go see Neil Young. And he's like, all right, buddy, we'll go. So we, uh, this is recently, too. It's within the last 10 years. So we saw Neil Young and... Next to us, standing on the floor, is this beautiful blonde girl and her mother. And, um, you know, she was probably in her 20s, like 25 or something. Um, and she looks at me and she goes, Any hey, idea who the opening act is? And I'm like, Yeah, Wilco. And she's like, Mom, you didn't tell me Wilco was the opening act. And you could totally tell she got dragged to Neil Young, did not want to <laughs> see Neil Young, but was ecstatic that Wilco was the opening act. And it just shows how, uh, you know, amazing Wilco is of a band that they could have probably played that place on their own, but they took the opportunity to open up for Neil Young because how much they admire him. Um, so, yeah, great band, yeah. dude. Great band. Yeah, I've seen Wilco three times, and one of the times they opened for Bob Dylan, um, you know, which is, you know, you talk about fans, uh, you know, not being receptive to other artists. I mean, I think Bob Dylan fans are, you know, definitely uh their own breed but yeah Wilco um you know Tweedy is so unassuming he's such a down-to-earth guy you know somebody you would definitely love to have a beer with and could hang out and would not have any pretensions at all um but just a cool band Jeff Tweedy's got a lot of solo stuff out there as well um but I, you know, they're always one of those bands. It's like, I'll, I'll buy whatever they put out. I don't care if I've never heard a single song out there, a single note of music, but I'm going to buy it because I know it'll be quality music and it'll, you know, reward uh, my listening. So, hey, so before we go, I just want to give a shout out to Chris. Like, Chris, we love you, brother. We hope that you feel better, man. We, we're really praying for you. Um, and I also wanted to say, one last thing. I really broke my heart to leave Springsteen's Magic off this list. That is a fantastic album. Tom Petty had an album called Mud Crutch, which is his first band. That was fantastic. And Metallica Death Magnetic. I listened to it again the other day. I'm just going to say this. I originally had the CD. That CD sucks. The CD... You can go Google it. It's the Loudness Wars. It sounded like shit. It really did. Uh, but Aaron had recommended that we listen to it on vinyl. I don't own the vinyl, but Apple Music has remastered it to sound like the vinyl. 
and it sounds a hundred times better. So those three albums I felt bad leaving off. And Aaron, you were right about Death Magnetic. It's not better than Master of Puppets. No, so it's the best since then, I think. Maybe. I'll agree. First three the best. I like Justice better, dude. I'm just gonna throw it out there. Yeah. Maybe I, the well, best I love it. Man, I was blasting that on Tuesday and it was just I mean, it's just like their old stuff where, where I talked about them losing it, where they didn't have the extra part of the song. Yeah. They're in that album all over through it. And that album is... But Justice has that too. And Justice, yeah. I feel like, has blackened. And you've heard of one yeah. you've heard a million times, but one is, it, it's a fantastic song. I don't yeah. care how many times you've got to give it props. It is great. Yeah, I, yeah. I like all albums, except yeah. for Reload, <laughs> which I like some of. But I, I think that's magnetic's definitely the best thing they've done in the 2000s easily yeah. not even close totally agree with that totally agree with that and it sounds much better not on cd yes yeah like i was saying i was listening to that vinyl i was like i was so mad i didn't play that for jeff and um chris when they were here because i was going to and i forgot because of how much better it sounds on vinyl it just didn't even sound like the same record yeah all right jeff all right, sorry well, we, we miss you chris miss you gary, miss you, chris. gary. Be with us next week and thanks everybody for watching.